Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders, and it is that time of the week. It's lecture time. This week's topic, guys, is the three fallacies that most traders make. Not just new traders, but even some experienced traders, guys. It's an important one because we dig a little bit deeper into psychology today. Don't worry, there's some charts in there too for those of you that can't pay attention to tech slides. Um, but we talk about the three fallacies in trading. The three fallacies are, guys, number one, use the tightest stop loss possible. A lot of you out there erroneously think that the tighter the stop loss, the higher the reward to risk, but there's so many problems with that thought process from the spread to the number of shares to the slippage you're gonna get. We're gonna talk about that as well. Number two is you can't go broke taking profits. The problem is many of you are going broke exactly for that reason. You're getting out of your winners way too soon while you're letting your losers tank against you. It's a massive problem. And the third one is get to break even as soon as possible. Wrong. It's another erroneous thought process. Many of you are getting to break even only to get shaken out and then watch the trade go in your direction ultimately. So those are the three fallacies in trading that we're gonna talk about today. I think they're very important. I think it's a good lecture because we dig a little deeper into the mentality. I show you some trader results of what people have done when they have used that thought process. You can't go broke taking a profit or you raise your stop loss to break even too soon. There's definite issues and problems with that. So I think it's a good lecture. I think you can learn a lot from it. As always guys, if you like these lectures, please click the like button. If you like the channel, please hit that, smash that, crush that subscribe button. I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. This week's lecture topic, guys, is the three fallacies of trading. The three fallacies of trading. Like, what the heck does that mean? Three things that get you guys in trouble, all right? Or slogans you may have heard, things you have read, et cetera, and so forth. But generally, things that get you guys in trouble. And we're here to hopefully fix some of those or get you to stop doing some of them. And I would be very, very certain that most of you have done these things at some point in your trading career and are probably still doing them. That's the problem, okay? So we'll talk about that. But before we do, I have one installment this week of when will the insanity stop, right? When will the insanity stop? Um, this one is not so much about money. It's about just the terrible, poor advice that you can get online sometimes. So let's take a quick look, okay? I'm not going to spend as much time. So this was on Reddit, actually. Um, dealing with large losses. So this was a little while back, um, but it happened to pop up recently and somebody sent it to me. Um, I felt like an unstoppable god and made a mistake that can only be described as completely effing retarded. How do you guys deal with it? Basically, the point is I gave up everything I've made for the entire year on one big loss. Does that sound familiar to any of you guys? Maybe not your entire year, but how about your entire week, your entire month? Anybody done that on a, what I call a stupid trade where you take a trade, you don't take your stop loss and it just keeps going against you and against you and you're like, and isn't it interesting, okay? And you can tell, you know, we've all been through this. Isn't it interesting how the second the trade goes against you, and you realize it's probably not coming back today, right? You get that point, it's probably not coming back today. What do you start doing? Sir, be honest about it. You start reading the news. You literally, you start going to Google and you start going to, to Yahoo Finance or NASDAQ.com and you start reading the news. All right, is there any, any earnings coming out soon? Is the CEO doing anything? Isn't it crazy? You know you've done it before because you're sitting there going, I should have taken my one R loss or slippage one and a half or two R and now you're down five R, 10 R, all right? And now you're in hopium, and that's not trading, that's gambling. But that wasn't really the point of when will the insanity stop today. The point was the advice that this person received at the bottom. First line, I, I ride it out. Last November, I experienced what many would have ran and took their losses. I'm talking 25, 30 grand a day down, right? I wrote it out and came back and more. It's a hard pill to swallow, but it's the problem when everyone jumps out of fear. There's a common saying, be like a fireman. You run into a burning house, not out of it. Well, in trading, you should never be close to a burning house. You should be out when, the, when you see the spark. The second you see the spark, you're gone, okay? Out the door. I'm not gonna stick around for the fire, all right? This is craziness. 
this is a trading comment, not an investment comment. This whole, this whole 71 comments were about this person's trading. And this is the advice that people get. And you wonder why they do such foolish things because they're getting advice from people they don't have any idea, have any clue about trading, but I guess it makes them feel good. Misery likes company. But my point is, is people are doing this stuff. So I guess I don't feel that bad for them. But this is the advice you get when you go out online and you hear it from these furus and gurus. And we saw it a couple weeks back. No, it's like actually a couple months back where somebody was down like five or $6,000 on a trade. And when they finally got to plus 100, they closed it out. Think about that. They didn't care what the bottom was, but they finally got back just above water and they get out of the trade. And that was one of those online internet YouTube furus. That's terrible money management. Just terrible. Take your licking. Live to fight another day, okay? All right, let's dig in. This is part of today's lecture, even though there's a couple slides before today's lecture, but it's part of today's lecture, okay? Trust me. All right, so Tesla fundamentals. No, this isn't a hate on Tesla, okay? And by the way, this was put in here on Monday. Tesla's like significantly higher now, isn't it? All right, um, so these numbers are a little bit off. I think I did this on Monday, all right? Um, so at the time, Tesla was at $401.52, okay? Now, the last I checked, and this is just a theory, just throwing it out there, you know, losing money in a business is not generally why you're in business, okay? At least, well, not why I'm in business. I mean, maybe some of you guys out there are, but Tesla lost, uh, what is that? Um, $862 million, is that what that comes out to in December 31st, that quarterly, all right? Um, but their PE ratio, and this is, as of nasdaq.com and yahoo finance is 1034.07 that's their pe ratio now is that accurate i don't know i just took the screenshot their market cap's 374 billion dollars okay and then tesla i don't know what they're trading now but it's higher than that so it might even be close to 400 billion dollars okay hold on just I want you to sync those numbers in. There's a point, there's a method to my madness. This isn't, this isn't about dogging on Tesla. It's not about that at all, okay? So their financials don't look the best. They're kind of spotty. The last four years in a row, they're getting better, they're getting worse, they're getting better, they're getting a little worse, they're getting better. I mean, it's just all over the map, okay? But their stock seems to do one thing. Why is 2020 like a Cinderella story for Tesla? I really truly don't know. Uh, I don't follow Tesla news, but I don't know why the stock has up five or 600% this year, all right? But I wanted to show this to you. And again, I'm getting to a point here. Trust me, there's a point, all right? Other than Elon token up, all right? Ford, GM, Chrysler, Fiat, Toyota, Honda, Volkswagen, Hyundai, Renault. Why did I pick those? Because they happen to be eight of the 10 largest manufacturers in the world. Eight of the 10 largest manufacturers in the world, right? They total about 476 billion in market cap. Tesla's worth 374 billion and now worth more than that, okay? So Tesla's worth 78% of the value of the top eight largest car manufacturers in the world. Those car manufacturers made 62 and a half million cars in 2018. Tesla made roughly 350,000, okay? 62 and a half million, 365,000. Now, the other thing I wanted to throw in here is most of these car manufacturers are very profitable, especially companies like Toyota and Honda are very, very profitable companies. I think we saw on the last slide that Tesla isn't. Now you're going, Jared, get to the point already, okay? And by the way, we'll get to NKLA in a second. Yes, it's on the next slide, all right? I have a point, I'm gonna make you wait for it. I have a point. I'm going to make you wait for it. I just wanted to just show you the numbers so you could see them, okay? Less than half, half, half a percent, half a percent, guys, of all the cars made in the world produced by Tesla in 2018. 88 million cars were produced. Tesla made less than half of 1% of them. But it has a larger market cap or a market cap that's 78% of the top eight largest car manufacturers in the world. So you got to ask yourself, if somebody gave you the option of owning all eight of these or owning Tesla, just on fundamentals, which would you choose? I'm not asking, I'm just asking you to think about it. Okay, just on fundamentals, which would you choose? There's a method to my madness, I'll get to it in a minute. Okay, NKLA, all right? 
This is the weekly chart of NKLA. Earlier this year, this company was, wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, and I'm not so much sure it's worth any more than that now. Uh, I just put this little smiley face here because it says data is currently not available for NKLA financials. I find that odd for a stock that's listed on the NASDAQ, that financials are not currently available. You are listed on the NASDAQ, so maybe I needed to dig deeper. Maybe they're on a different website. But I consider NASDAQ.com to be, you know, fairly reliable. You would hope that on NASDAQ.com, it's a NASDAQ stop, they would at least have the financials for NKLA, right? Method to the madness is coming. They don't make any money, okay? Their estimates are minus 30 cents a share. Um, yeah, not such a good thing. Last I checked, they don't have a working vehicle. Last I checked, the SEC is investigating now for, I don't want to say fraud, but potential fraud. Okay, because when you show a truck moving and it's literally rolling, not under its own power, but because of the law of physics, that's a problem. You're sitting there, okay, Jared, that's great. What does this all come down to? By the way, I just want to show that. Nicola refutes fraud claims, but acknowledges that its truck wasn't driving itself. They admit to faking the video of driving a prototype in a weak response to allegations. These are news reports from a couple days ago. Okay. How does this company have a market cap that's nearing $15 billion? How does Tesla have a market cap that's 78% as big as the top eight largest car manufacturers in the world? The point I'm getting at is fundamentals just don't matter. They're irrelevant. I mean, wasn't it but a year ago that Elon Musk got a slap on the wrist? On the wrist because basically he came out and if anybody else made the comment he did or the tweet he did, they, you know, I don't want to say they'd be in jail, but they would have gotten a, a much bigger backlash than he got. So I'm commenting because so many of you guys out there are looking at fundamentals. P.E. ratios, the management team, the CEO comments on TV or social media, Elon Musk, financial statements, balance sheets, economic conditions. Guys, all of these things are being massaged. Trust me, they're being massaged. Okay. Have you ever, and I'll get to it on the next slide, have you ever seen a CEO come on television and say, yeah, our company's in hot water right now, man. We are in some serious trouble right now. If I were you, I'd stay away from our stock like the plague. Have you ever heard the, the, the um, Nicola CEO come out and say, yeah, we actually don't have a working vehicle. No, they dance around the important stuff because it's an illusion. So what I'm getting at guys is the stock market is just based off of perception. And that perception is not always based off of actual information. It's based off of what you're hearing on television, what the CEO is saying on Twitter or on TV, right? It's based off of accounting statements that aren't always, let's just say, honest. I think we found that out with Enron, WorldCom, right? So why does the world spend so much time looking at these things? Why do you guys spend so much time looking at these things? They're all massaged. They're all manipulated. Why? For the purpose or the betterment of the company, not the betterment of the investor, the betterment of the company. If I can get you to believe something, what is that? I think Hitler said it. If you tell a lie long enough, it becomes the truth or tell a lie long enough until it becomes true. I can't remember what Hitler said, something to that effect. Somebody will get me the right quote. This is basically the practice of CEOs. Lie to people long enough so that they believe what we're telling them and they buy our stock and make a company like NKLA worth $15 billion so we can get more investor money and the stock price will raise. I mean, a thousand PE ratio on Tesla, a thousand. That means the stock price is worth a thousand times more than their earnings. La La Land? Will Tesla ever be worth that kind of money? It's very hard to say and super early to say. Okay, there it is. 
If you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. Somebody always gets me, right? So fundamentals are not relevant to your trading. So now I'm bringing it back to trading. Fundamentals have no relevance whatsoever to your trading. Think shock value. That's what CEOs are thinking. Let's come out and say something that will push our stock higher. There's an agenda. All stocks look cheap and viable on their way to zero. I, this is one of my favorites because you guys come out and be like, but Jared, it's really cheap. It's got to go higher. No, it doesn't. It's cheap for a reason. Hmm. Wait, that's, wait, there's too much common sense. Let's just stop right there. Okay. Circumstances and news can change by the minute. Look at Oracle. Remember Oracle on Monday, guys? Do you guys remember Oracle? We'll see it on the next slide. I'll come back to it. You ready? This was Oracle on Monday. Oracle's buying TikTok. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. No, they aren't. Oh, wait. Yes, they are. Oh, wait. What the? F now Walmart's buying TikTok? Do you guys remember that? That actually happened on Monday. And you guys are focused on news. You're focused on what the CEO says. You're focused on PE ratios. It's insane. It'll make your head spin. So Oracle gets halted for 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it was, and then does all this, a big fat nothing. Walmart rips out of nowhere, goes up $4 almost on a five minute chart, and then does what? Comes right back down and does nothing. All because of news, which can change by the minute, all right? There are no specific entries or exits using fundamentals. There just aren't. You just get in because you think the company's good and therefore because it's good fundamentally, it's going to go higher. Why? GE makes a ton more money than Tesla and GE stock's worth about six bucks. Although they did take a pretty big charge down this year. They're worth six bucks. Huh, interesting. So information, statistics, numbers, accounting can all be made up to suit the company's needs and narratives and their agenda. Focus on the chart. Focus on the chart because I see way too many emails I get, comments in the chat room about you guys going, oh, they just built a new model car. Oh, they just did this. Oh, the CEO just said that. You guys do it almost every single day. Every day somebody makes a comment about it. Even that one stock was a brand new issue today. What do you think about, I can't remember the symbol. What do you think about it? I don't know, it's the first day it's traded. I have no prior information. I don't have an opinion on it. Snow, there it is, snow. I don't have an opinion on it. How could I have an opinion on it? There's no prior information for me to judge for it, from it. But you guys are all about trading it. You all wanna get rich quick. You all wanna find the next pet rock. Stop, just stop, okay? Focus on what actually matters. Price and volume, charts. Okay, just remember this one, Oracle buying TikTok. No, they aren't. Oh, wait, they are. No, now Walmart's buying. Wait, I think it's Oracle again, but they're not actually buying their algorithm. Whatever. So let's get into the three fallacies of trading. There was a lead in for a reason. Okay, there's a lead in for a reason. If you know where the market is going, does it guarantee you're going to make money? Think about it for a second. If you know where the market's going, does it guarantee you're going to make money? Well, many people say yes to this. The theory sounds good, doesn't it? Right? The theory does sound good. But it's not the reality. The theory and the reality are two different things. We see stocks go up all the time that you guys get out of before you're supposed to. We, stock, we see stocks drop all the time that you stay into when you should have gotten out of. So, you know, that comment that trading is somewhat counterintuitive. I don't know that it's necessarily counterintuitive. It seems like traders are very counterintuitive. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to make money. So these are the three fallacies we're going to talk about today. Tight stops losses are the best way to trade. Eric, this is for you. Okay, get your stop loss to break even as soon as possible. And you can't go broke taking a profit. We're going to talk in deep. Don't worry, there's some charts involved today. Tight stop losses are the best way to trade. Get your stop to break even as soon as possible and you can't go broke taking a profit. I'm here to tell you that these three things are precisely the reason many of you aren't making money, okay? So where does this come from, tight stop losses? Likely the idea that a tight stop loss translate into a higher reward to risk. That's the only, I mean, it's one of the few things I can think of. I think, okay, the tighter my stop loss, 
And the more the stock moves, the more I make. So if I use a 10 cent stop loss and the stock moves a dollar, I make 10 to one. If I use a 50 cent stop loss and moves a dollar, I only make two to one. So people are always, always, always looking for the tightest possible stop loss. But they're not factoring in a lot of other things. What are some of the issues with this statement? Well, it's easier to get shaken out of only to watch it possibly go higher later. You need more shares of a stock when you have a tighter stop loss, which means it's harder to get filled. Spready and whippy stocks will give you far more slippage when you stop out with a tighter stop loss. Try a dollar stop on Amazon and tell me how it goes. Sure, when it works, you feel like a hero, but when you lose, you're gonna lose three to one on that thing because just the slippage alone is gonna hurt, okay? And you're gonna get shaken out of it quickly. Some stocks need to wiggle. So you're likely to get stopped out a lot more often, just like the shaken out thing. So this idea is a fallacy. Use the chart for your stop loss. Look at the spread of the stock. Look at the whippiness of the stock. Look at the price of the stock to get a better idea or understanding what your stop loss should be. This idea that the tightest possible stop loss is the best is not accurate. Okay, and people love to tell me when they made five to one or 10 to one on a trade, but they don't like to tell me the slippage they take when they stop out. Okay, and besides, when you talk about risk level, you're risking the same amount of money. It's not like you're, you're risking less money because the stop loss is tighter. You're risking the same amount of money. Okay, general flaw, newer traders think they'll lose less with tight stops. Well, it's deeply ingrained in the idea of the get rich quick trader mentality. The tighter my stop, the quicker I can get to my target or the quicker I can get a huge target, okay? It's the same reason so many traders are drawn to penny stocks. Be honest, you're drawn to penny stocks, they're cheap. The perceived tight stop losses with the idea that they move a lot, oh, and I have a small account so I can actually trade penny stocks. It's perfect for suckers, man. It's perfect for gamblers. It's not that you can't make money trading penny stocks, I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you look, guys, okay, and I hate to be honest about this because it pisses people off, but go to any penny stock trading room. I bet you 90% of the traders in there have an account less than $10,000. Most of them have probably a one to $5,000 account. Why? Because they're not ready to be a trader yet. They're just a hacker. They're a gambler. They're drawn to the idea of you can take $1,000 and turn it into 100,000 or 500 and turn it into a million, all right? all the Furu Fourier's out there. That's what they're drawn to. It's an erroneous thought because it goes, it all ties back to the get rich quick mentality. The one thing that this will do though, it'll make you an X trader real quick. It'll blow up your account real quick. So they sit there and go, well, I can't buy a thousand shares of Amazon. I better go trade a $2 stock because I can buy a thousand shares of that. And maybe I can get a five cent stop loss and maybe it'll pop 20 cents. It's erroneous, okay? Get your stop losses to break even. Again, don't worry. You've got plenty of charts coming for you. I know you guys have a hard time focusing on text slides. I know, I know. You like the sex appeal. Get your stop to break even as soon as possible. But guys, break even stops are a mental crutch, period. For 90 plus percent of traders, they're a mental crutch. Ideally, stops should be based on the chart, not on emotions. We base stop losses off the chart because they give us an edge, right? Past price action predicts future price movement or helps predict future price movement. That's the whole crux of technical analysis trading. So getting to break even is a mental crutch. It's something we do to quote, handle the trade, right? There's something about Mary, you know what I'm talking about, those of you know. The chart has no idea where break even is. The chart has no idea what break even is. The chart doesn't know where you got in. And remember, not everybody in the world is trading three bar plays, breakouts, and buy setups. Unwall just bought a, a buy limit on BABA today. Bought it on a pullback in a semi-random area. The chart doesn't know where break even is for you. So why would you base break even? Or why would you get to bake break even without basing it off of the chart? It's a reaction based on having a stronger fear of loss and hope for gain. Admit it. Admit it, it's at a reaction based on having a stronger fear of loss than a hope for gain. Why do traders let losers run and cut winners short? Ego and fear, that's it. It's a fact. 
it's a fact. You need to accept this fact. Okay, now, are there exceptions? Yeah, you guys are sitting there going, wait a second, Jared, what the hell are you doing here? You, you break even, you move to break even on your stops all the time on every damn trade you do it. I do. And it's two things. It's a mental crutch. You could have to admit that because it is. It's a mental crutch. And two, I find it to be profitable for my style of trading. But many of you out there moving your stop to break even, break even just be truthful about it. You haven't back tested it over 500 to 1,000 trades. You haven't. You haven't done it. You're just doing because it, it, it helps you mentally as a crutch. Okay? Some of you have done the back test, but most of you haven't. So you don't even know if moving your stop to break even is more profitable than not moving your stop to break even. So it's a mental crutch because of fear. Your fear of loss is stronger than your hope for gain. Okay? It, it just flat out is. Now, this is what I want to get at. And this is the fine line here. We're dancing a fine line. Every trader has to manage one thing first, themselves. You have to manage your personality first. Okay? We all do. We all have to manage personality first. So I don't mind a trader having a slight mental crutch. But the fact of the matter is to learn proper trading, you should be using a style that's conducive to your personality, but still makes money. And you're not going to know what that style is in your first three or four months. You're still going to learn it. Most of the time that I've done a back test over the last 10 or 15 years, three are all or nothing beats almost everything I've ever tried. But mentally for me, I can't do it. I have a very, very hard time holding for 3R targets without raising my stop loss. Yet, the numbers, the back test, the statistics suggest I should just do it. That is the $64,000 question in trading. What do we do about something that's more profitable, but something you can't follow? Is this a Nike commercial? It's not. You don't, quote, just do it. It sounds really good in theory. But breaking your plan is a sure way to the poorhouse. So what I'm getting at is going to break even almost always is, in fact, a mental crutch. But is it okay sometimes? It is. But your goal should not be to get to break even because it's a mental crutch. Your goal should be to get to break even because it's more profitable. Now for me, and again, I, I preface this very clearly, I find 2R targets, moving my stop to break even at 1R, is more profitable than all or nothing. But they're close. They're very close. But it's not as profitable as 3R all or nothing. So in that case, you could make the argument it's no longer a mental crutch. But the problem with you guys is you don't know that. You haven't done that back test. So you're just, you're just doing it because it's a mental crutch. So my point simply is, Generally speaking, over the long run, not right now, we're in some choppy markets, moving your stop to break even is not generally a good idea. Holding to target, and I'm not saying all or nothing is the be all end all. Moving your stop based off the chart is what I'm getting at. Move it up on a bar by bar, move it up on a pivot, but don't just randomly move it up because you want to move it up. Unless you have a back test of at least six to 12 months, 500 to 1,000 trades that says it's more profitable to do so. Okay? Can't go broke taking profits. One of my favorites. It's completely erroneous thinking. The only world in which this is not erroneous thinking is if you have 100% batting average. Right? It sounds good in theory, right? So does communism. Yeah, going all political on you, I know. But it does. It sounds good in theory. So you can't go broke taking a profit. I mean, if you, if you get out when it's green, you're making money, right? Yeah, if you have 100% batting average, sure. But nobody has 100% batting average except for most of the gurus online. They all do because they're perfect. Okay? In reality, the only way this works is if you never lose. But we all lose. We all lose. So balancing your win-loss ratio and your batting average is key here. This creates a positive expectancy. But most traders don't do this. They either have a high batting average and a really low win-loss ratio or a high win-loss ratio and a low batting average. Now, I'm not saying that's a terrible thing per se, but most traders, they go broke by doing exactly this. 
because it takes one loss to take out five, six, seven, eight winners. Admit it. You can't go broke taking profits. Most traders do this out of fear. It gives them an excuse to sell. It gives them an excuse to break their plan. But this is exactly how most of you guys go broke. Can't go broke taking profits. I want you to think about this for a second. Trader has an education. They took professional trading strategies. They took a course somewhere else, wherever. They got an education somewhere. They've become tech technically proficient. Usually have more winners than losers, meaning their batting average is above 50 or 60%. They're usually able to create a compelling gap list and locate actual patterns, genuine patterns. Overall, this trader feels pretty good about their approach and their progress. But all too frequently, they're break even at the month's end. Next month will be better. I'm so close, I can feel it. Next time. Sound like anybody you know? Got an education, relatively proficient. They tend to win more than they lose. Build a decent gap list. They're able to recognize buy setups, breakouts, w, w bottoms, M tops, whatever, three bar plays. Overall, you're feeling like, hey man, I'm doing all right. And then you're break even. Now, I'm not talking about somebody in the first month or two or three, but you're a year in, you're two years in, maybe even three. Some months you're up, some months you're down, but really you're just kind of treading water. But I'm going to get it next month. I'm so close. Everything we just talked about, those three fallacies is why. Okay. And now let's take a look. Remember this trade? I think we went over this last week. Okay. Forget about the high level gaps with good relative strength, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So what happened here? The first trade on GM stopped out, right? Wide range red bar followed by a wide range green bar. That's a turnaround bar play. You got in right here. You stopped out right here. You got in right there off the open. I did anyway. I should say me. I got in right there. Stopped out right there. How many of you too scared to get back in? Fear of loss stronger than your hope for gain. Oh, I can't, I can't stop out on this twice. Can't do that. And then what happens? You live the rest of the day pissed off. You know how many emails I get over this, this crap? Forget about the re-entry for a second. You know how many emails I get where a decent pattern doesn't work? This is a decent pattern and it doesn't work. And they sit here and complain like a little baby. And it went higher for the entire rest of the day. I can't believe it. Happens to me all the time. Every trade I take this happens to me. Uh-huh. And you're just going to just, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Just get back in it. In this case, we got back in on a different pattern. But what if you use the 84% rule? You just got back in at your original entry or the original stop. You would have made money. Right? This was the entry back in, 3150. Now, this is not meant to show you something good. You're like, wait, wait, what do you mean? You told us to get back in. We make all our money back. This was a mistake I made last week. So I got back in, not that it was a bad entry per se, stopped out on the first trade. You can see it. I was down $539. Take a look at the top here. All right. I lost $539 on the first trade. Okay. The second trade, I'm ready to get back in. You can see my shares right there, right? Got about a thousand dollar risk on this. 2000 shares, 50 cent stop loss. Whoops. Sorry. My bad. Moved on too quick. And what did I do? I nickel and dimed it. And I got out for like a $300, $400 gain. Can't go broke taking profits. It's exactly how I did on this trade. If, I, if GM was the example of how I traded on every trade, I wouldn't make my, any money ever. Can't lose 500 on the first. Have the second trade. Let's go back. Have the second trade go to, what was it? 33.25? I mean, that's a $1.75 move. This is what most of you are doing though. Maybe you stop out on your first trade and what do you do on your second trade? As soon as you get your $500 back, you get out. That is the definition of you can't go broke taking profits. But you guys are doing this all the time. 
many of you won't even get back in it. And the ones that do get back in it, you're just happy to get your money back. Is that, is that how we should be trading long term? What happens here on this next one? Nice gap. We saw this last week too. I'm doing this on purpose. All right. Gap up. Beautiful. Over four red bars. Plenty of room to go higher. Beautiful pre-market break. What happens? The stock pops and pulls right back. Now remember, you're in right there. You have to ride out that bottom. What happens? You get in at nine bucks. Okay. And bet you many of you right here talking about moving your stop to break even. Got tagged right at break even. Right there. You probably got filled at 901, 902, 903, something like that. Whatever. Okay. Popped up 20 cents, pulls right back, tags you at breaking, and just continues on higher. Move that stop to break even as soon as you can. Get it to break even as quick as you can. And then watch it go 80 cents or 5R higher after it tagged you for zero gain. Wow. You guys do this all the time. Is your fear of loss strong and your hope for gain? Ask yourself that. Who's really trading? The person who's scared or the person who trusts and believes in the pattern? Now, isn't it interesting how before you take it, you're feeling pretty good. You're feeling confident. You're like, yeah, this is a good pattern. You know, I got down most of my checklist. It looks pretty good. One second after you enter the trade, unless it pops super hard, unless it pops really hard quickly, What's the first thing you think? Oh, I hope it doesn't stop out, man. I hope this thing keeps going higher. What if you get into a trade and it kind of, you know, moves up or down a few pennies, say five cents. It moves up or down a nickel for like five minutes. What starts happening? Your hope for gain starts dwindling, sucking the life out of you. And that hope for gain has moved into fear of loss. That's what happens to most traders. But, but, Aren't we odds-based traders? Don't the odds determine our success or failure? So does it matter? No. It shouldn't matter is the answer. But it does. But it doesn't. But it shouldn't. <laughs> right? So you know when Unwall gets in a trade? He's like, I don't, it doesn't matter. Go back to watching TV. I can't control it anyway. It's out of my control. The decision I made was to enter the position. I did my homework before the game started. I trained, I worked hard, I put my checklist there, I got into trade, I set a target, I set a stop loss, it's out of my control. There's no fear of loss or hope for gain, it just is what it is, it's nothing. The market's neither right nor wrong. After that, it's just down to odds. So again, two minute three bar play. Gap down, wide range bar, narrow range bar, looking good. Looking real good, sitting at the whole number there. So far, it looks, you know, pretty textbook to me. All right, so here it is. There it is, wide bar, narrow bar, hasn't quite triggered, it's turned into a four bar play. I have a thousand shares of this. I'm looking to add a couple thousand more shares right at the $80 mark, okay? Actual trade, all right? Wide bar on AXP, I know it's a little bit small, I apologize. Narrow bar, narrow bar, looking for this thing to break 80 bucks. Okay, hold on. That's what it looks right there. Really nice. Following the textbook. Didn't do anything wrong. Put the order in. Haven't done anything wrong. So far, so good. What do we have right now? Hope for gain. That's the mental approach right now. Beautiful pattern. Putting the order in. Hope for gain is strong. Ooh, hope for gain is really strong. Shit's looking good. Moving in my direction, okay? Up 415 bucks on it. It's moving down, looking good. Shit, damn it. Now, what's the point of this slide? What's the purpose here? What's the genuine purpose here? This is exactly, okay, let me see if I go one more here. This trade reinforces bad habits. This trade reinforces bad habits because you did everything right. 
And shouldn't this be one of those get to break even as soon as possible trades? You can't go broke taking a profit trade, shouldn't it? Up 400 and some bucks. Get to break even, can't lose. Take some money off, can't lose. This reinforces bad habits. You look at it and you go to yourself, okay, gap down, 80 bucks was the entry. We're below support. This is our tradable void. We get a wide bar, a narrow bar. It goes down and then goes completely rolls on us the opposite direction. This takes you back to those fallacies. It takes you back to, I knew I should have moved my stop to break even. I knew I should have taken some off. But yet the trade was looking great. You can't predict this wide range green engulfing bar. There's nobody in the world that can predict that except for the Furus online. So this happens to you, and what do you do on the next trade? You take some off on the drop, you move to break even, and the next one works. And instead of making 2,000 on it, you make 1,000 bucks on it. You do it again on the third trade, same thing happens. You do it again on the fourth trade, same thing happens. Wait, I'm not done. On the fifth trade, you finally say, F it. I'm following my plan come hell or high water. Boom, this happens to you again. Son of a bitch. Murphy, man, the market just knows you. You're trying to play the market. The market can't be played. Only you can be played. Has it ever happened to anybody like that? You take this trade and you manage it perfectly to your plan. Pissed off because it looked great, perfect, doesn't work. Next trade, you say, I'm not doing that again. So the second this stock starts to come back against you on the second trade, the second time you take it, a similar pattern, you move to break even or take some off. And then it flashes above break even, takes you out, goes lower and hits target. Happens again on the third trade and you get out of break even. Happens again on the fourth trade, you get out of break even. By the fifth trade, you said, I've had enough of this crap. I'm following my plan, come hell or high water. And then that's the trade that does this to you. And what are you doing? You're chasing your tail. All you're doing is chasing your tail. Round and round and round you go and you wanna know why you're not profitable because you're not consistent. Because you're not consistent. This is really the only time that people have a stronger hope for gain than a fear of loss. When a stock triggers and immediately rips. But when stocks chop a little, the devil on your shoulder starts talking, starts yip-yapping, starts popping off, starts to put doubt in your mind. This is the only time that you don't have doubt in your mind because they just hit so hard. There's no, you can't mess this up. It's the only trade you can't F up because it hits and runs so hard you're at target before you can even get your hand on the mouse button to get out of it. Sell, market, market, market. But when they don't do this, you're starting to think, man, it hasn't gone. It's been 32 seconds already. I'm on, a, I'm on a 60 minute chart and it's been at least a minute already. And this thing hasn't gone up $9 yet. I'm not up 4R yet. And it's, we're up two, it's two minutes now. Oh my gosh. Breathe. Woo-so. Okay, I know it's a 60 minute chart. Now I understand, but, but two minutes in, this thing should be up at least half an hour already. Woo-so. I got to take a walk. Come back five minutes later. I went and played with my daughter. Remember somebody said that yesterday. I said, wow, you're back soon. Yeah, it was a quick, she's fast. So now we're six minutes into a 60 minute trade and it still hasn't ripped. Now what? The fear of loss is growing. It's growing and it's growing and it keeps growing to the point where you get out of the trade, move to break even or sell some of your shares. Cause you know, you can't go broke taking a profit and get to break even as soon as possible. It's exactly what happens to people. Right? It's exactly what happens to people. This, this is what traders look like. You guys saw this a long while back. I put this up a long while back. Now I'm just going to focus on the bottom because it's the only thing that really matters. 55% batting average, six winners, five losers, person made $32 after fees. Granted, we don't have trade fees anymore. This was a while ago, but still you get the point. Six winners, five losers to make $32 average risk was $155. Average risk was 155 bucks. Let's not talk about all the other stuff. Risk is all over the map. I get it. It's not the point. 32 to how many of you do, how many of you do this? 
Seriously, how many do this? You take five, 10 trades to make minimal money. And yet your batting average is 55%. Crazy. Your average winner is eight cents. Your average loser is 11 cents. Craziness. Nuts. How about this? You guys have seen this a while back too. 14 up days, eight down days, $694 on $145 risk. So you had 14 up days to eight down days. Basically almost 70% of the time you're up. Almost 70% of the days you are up. You make money 70% of the time. And you only made four R this month? Four and a half R? Is that a joke? 70% of the time you're up, but you make four R. Your trading plan, on the other hand, had it been followed, made somewhere in the neighborhood of 44 R. So just take one of the fours off for you, 4.7 R for you, and your plan made 44 R. And guess what? Very similar up to down days. Your trading plan had seven down days and 15 up days. Think about it for a second. 70% of the time you were up and you only made four and a half R. Your trading plan was up 15 days and seven down days. Very similar to 14 and eight, right? But your trading plan made 10 times more money than you because you're nickel and diming the shit out of everything. You're nickel and diming the shit out of everything instead of just letting them ride. Think about it. This should tell you a little bit about human psychology. I showed you guys this a few months ago, okay? I'll read it briefly. Who cares who did the experiment, okay? Students were told to assume they had just won $30. You just won 30 bucks. You're offered a coin flip upon which they would win nine or lose $9. Okay, so you're offered a coin flip. You have $30 in your pocket. Coin flip to win nine, so that means you'll, you'll be up 39 bucks or lose nine, you'll be down to 21 bucks. 70% of the students opted for the coin flip. 70% took the coin flip. They did the same experiment, $30 for certain versus a coin flip in which you'd get 21 or $39. Only 43% of the people opted. Guys, what's the difference? There's no difference. They're the same damn thing. What's the difference? 70% of the people chose the first one. Or exactly. Well, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Fear. Here's the problem. The second paragraph is really the, the $64,000 comment. Some of the problems of interpreting human behavior in the face of risk has to do with, and this is important, the problem of people making decisions on the basis of subjective assessments of probabilities, which may be quite different from the objective or true probabilities. Think about it. The subjective assessment of probabilities versus the objective or true. And I'll tie this all the way back to fundamentals. Fundamentals are not objective or true probabilities because people lie. CEOs lie. Account statements lie. Accountants lie. How many companies in the world have gotten in trouble for fudging their financials? A lot. Subjective assessments versus objective or true probabilities. This doesn't mean I hate fundamentals. That's not to say that. But don't trade off of fundamentals. This is what I'm telling you. We're not sitting here for 20 years holding a position. You're sitting here for 20 minutes, 20 days maybe. Don't trade off of fundamentals. And I'll tie it back into what we just talked about. Fear of loss is stronger than hope for gain. The second you go green, you immediately go from hope for gain to fear of loss. The immediate time you go red, you automatically go, I hope for gain. Screw the loss. I can't lose. My ego is so big. There's no way I could take a, lo a loss on this. I'll sell it a penny in the money. But I'm willing to lose a dollar to make that penny. How many of you have been there? I'm willing to let the stock go down a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, but the second it gets back to break even or slightly above, I'm gone. I'm out of here. Whew, thank you, Lord. I got back to break even. 
but you didn't care what your risk exposure was, what your loss exposure potentially was. That's not trading. That's gambling. And you want to know why so many people fail? It's because of that attitude. And no, I'm here to tell you emphatically, it is not a badge of honor and it's not acceptable to ever blow up a trading account. Not ever. It's not part of the learning process. Anyone who tells you that, run away from them. You should never blow up a trading account, ever. Okay? If your trading account's 500 bucks, trade at dollar risk, trade one share lots. You still, we won't blow up your account. And you shouldn't really be trading with $500 anyway. So how many trades have you taken on pure subjectivity? It looks strong, so it has to go higher. They crushed earnings, so I, ju I just know it's gonna work. Have you seen the new XYZ product? It's killer. That stock's ready to take off. It's so extended, it has to pull back. I'm gonna add more shares on the way down because the fundamentals are just so good. You've all done it. Get to break even as quick as possible. Can't go broke, taking profits. Stop, guys. That's all I can tell you. So I'll ask and I'll end with this. Is your fear of loss stronger than your hope for gain? What does this really asking? What this is really asking is simple. Do you trust the odds? That's all this question really is. Is your fear of loss stronger? The question should just be, do you trust the odds? If the answer is no, then your fear of loss is stronger than your hope for gain. If the answer is yes, I genuinely, truly, deeply inside trust the odds, then your hope for gain is stronger than your fear of loss. That's all it comes down to. So you got to ask yourself when you get into a new trade, where do you stand? Most people, fear of loss. And this is, hold on. Yep, I'll tie it all the way back, all the way back. Right back to this. Tight stops are the way to go. Get your loss to break even, get your stop loss to break even as soon as possible. You can't go broke taking profit. All these things are based out of fear. Right? They're all based on fear. So, do you trust the odds or not? I'll leave you with that. All right? Do you trust the odds or not? All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that lecture. Hope you got a little bit out of it. Um, and I hope it will help you adjust or change your trading to be more profitable. I'm Jared Wesley. We'll get back at it again next week.